Hey, Manufacturing World, welcome to another episode of Shop Matters, sponsored by Akuma America. I'm your host, Wade Anderson. Joining me in the studio here in Charlotte, North Carolina today, I've got Rob Karen from Karen Engineering and John Joseph from Datanomics. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Thank you, thanks Wade. Thanks for having well, us. Glad to be here. Yeah. So take a moment and just uh, kind of give a quick introduction about yourself. Um, Rob, I, I know uh, a lot of us at Akuma, we know Rob Karen and Karen Engineering well, really well, but people outside that don't, uh, give us a little bit about your background and your company. Okay. Well, um, I started the company 35 years ago. Uh, Karen Engineering has always been a company that's developed uh, unique solutions uh, th that are not available normally on, on machine tools. Um, we develop uh, sensing technology uh, for tool monitoring. We work in the RFID field for uh, tool offset, um, automatic tool offset setting from tool presetters. We do automatic gauge feedback from measuring devices. So all these products um, are not like automatically coming on machine tools. So basically everything we do allows the machine to run better, more efficient, and allow a, a easier transition into unattended operation. So that, that's um, kind of the basis of our product line. Okay. Where are you headquartered out of? We're in uh, Maine, the state of Maine. Yep. Uh, so up yeah. in the Northeast where it's snowing right now. Yeah. Always famous for your lobsters Absolutely. for open yeah. houses. And exactly. Events, we right? do uh, lobster rolls at our booth at IMTS every year, every two years. So There you go. So anybody going to IMTS, make sure you check them out for a lobster <laughs> Absolutely. roll. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. John, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I've got two vouchers for lobster rolls at Rob's booth <laughs> now that I know he's having lobster. Uh, so I'm one of the co-founders of Datanomics, currently the CEO of the company. Datanomics is a manufacturing analytics technology we connect very simply to CNC machines, just about any machine that um, is uh, of the right vintage and is able to broadcast a protocol called MT Connect. Mm -hmm. Once we connect to that machine, we are extracting the data off that machine and uh, being able to look at your production cycle time utilization, part production, and we calculate a production score from A plus to C minus. Uh, that production score is broadcast up on a TV screen for the entire production staff to, to look at, react to, and respond to. Our objective is not to do machine monitoring. Our, our objective is to be a production management framework. And uh, we're trying to get people focused on jobs that need improvement and getting them move, uh, moving towards jobs that need to be debugged and get uh, brought back on track. So, uh, so far, things have been very successful. Pe people love our product. I think the one differentiation in our product from the rest of the market is that uh, all of the data that we derive for our, our broadcasting system for our production score is derived directly from the machine. We don't require any input from operators whatsoever. Oh, excellent. So you guys are, are really good companies that um, benefit one another, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. you guys work together in conjunction. Tell me a little bit about that tie-in. I mean, how does Karen Engineering and Datanomics really marry up well and provide benefit to the customers? Well, Karen Engineering's products uh, provide really you know high fidelity data um, very very accurate data very high precision and high resolution data um, about the whole process of the machine whether it be you know the measurement of tools going into the machine to the actual measurement of the cutting process and in the cutting in the cutting environment and then also the part quality as the part leaves the machine so so we've got all this really uh, amazing data that you know we, we know is it's got more value to it than just what we do with it on each machine um, we look at datanomics because they, their data science capability and analytics now allows them to take our data and do a much more in-depth look and advanced ana analysis of what's going on. And, and they are looking across an entire plant, so they can uh, sort of summarize all that data together and come up with anomalies and problems and, and maybe suggestions of better operating conditions based on the analytics using machine learning and artificial intelligence. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would say that um, Karen Engineering was a natural fit for us. Natural fit because the journey that we're on is uh, a journey less, of, again, as I said, less about machine monitoring and more about a horizon, a, a spectrum of, of monitoring technology that starts with the cutting tool itself and works its way all the way up to business impact. Mm -hmm. So with the Karen sensor technology, we're able to, as Rob said, we're able to uh, intercept a high fidelity uh, data stream, process that data stream, embed the Karen um, outputs into our product so that our customers can see every instance of Karen within our product in their production facility on the TV screens that they've mounted to create this visual factory experience. And uh, it's very important that we go all the way from the tool to the machine itself, 
to the factory uh, production system and to the business implications of what all that means so that people see everything from the mechanical engineering to the business process. Okay. Yeah. Can you step me through, give me like a, a real world example um, of, a, of a part or a, you know, you don't have to actually name a, a company or part, but real world example of how a shop owner, biggest question I wind up getting hit with a lot of times when we talk about um, data monitoring or data collection, things like that is um, where's the customer base? Is it large shops? Is it small shops? And then as they get this data, what do they do with it? How do they see and realize a return on that investment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll start off. I think what's really interesting here is that the people we sell our technology to are people that are experts at uh, subtractive and additive machining, right? Mm -hmm. And so they've spent their entire careers figuring out how to optimize a process of removing material from raw stock. And the Karen Engineering solution helps in that optimization process. What we learned on our journey was that um, the ability to transform data into usable, actionable, contextualized information to get people moving towards problem solving wasn't as apparent as um, their ability to machine parts well and at high quality and, and high rates of speed. So we focus on the data transformation aspect of it, and we rely upon the Karen Engineering um, uh subtractive machining process, the, the cutting process, the, the tool life, tool management, we ex take that data and convert it into uh, actionable insights that informs people um, when they're on track and when they're off track. So okay. that's a, the, the kinds of customers we sell into range from 20 machine shops to 2,000 machine shops. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they want to be able to see these cutting tools in operation, in action, real time, right? So the focus is uh, to give them that information as it's happening, not after it's happening. Okay. Yeah, and I don't think the shop size is really the determining factor, more of, you know, a, a shop that's just doing one-off parts may not be as applicable to it, but anybody that's doing any sort of numbers of parts, um, the more numbers you have for any machine learning type uh, calculations, the easier it is to see, you know, anomalies that are happening in a process. So I, I think the shop size is, is less relevant than that. Okay. So if you take a, a manufacturing process that somebody's been doing for a while and they kind of have it dialed in, they have it running the way they want to, um, you have a company X comes in with a new cutting tool, new piece of technology, they want to try that out mm -hmm. and realize whether or not this actually does what it says it will do. Is that an area where you yeah. guys kind of fit Absolutely. in? Absolutely, okay. yeah. So, you know, we're looking at all parts of the data. So we're looking at the, the geometry of tools going into the machine. That's part of our system as well. What, what were the measurements of the tool going in? Then we're looking at the cutting data as the tool cuts the part. And then we even have our you know, external component, which is in our Autocom product, where we're looking at the measured data of the part, looking at part quality, how much adjustment was required to keep the part in tolerance. So using those parameters, we can now, and, and using the, you know, having datanomics collected from a machine learning standpoint, they can actually do an analysis of, did this tool cut better? Looking at all those parameters. Um, so so it actually give, lends itself very easily to, did this different type of tool uh, improve the process? Or is it actually doing a few things better, but there's other things it's doing worse? Okay. And so by looking at that entire um, flow of, of process, then we can, we can datanomics side can do that. Okay. And I think there are cost implications to new tools, right? People right. Um, have to measure their complete cost of goods sold. It's raw material, it's labor, it's machining time, it's uh, you know preventive maintenance costs and things like that all wrapped into it. We look at that because we're extracting that data from sensors uh, like the Karen sensors and the machine itself, wrap that up and turn that into cost implications, and it gives you that spectrum of tool to business impact all in one, uh, you know, uh, one user interface. Right. And that's an important aspect. I know from the machine tool side, um, there's there's trade-offs to everything, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of basic economics, mm -hmm. always trade-offs to everything that you do. So you can take a part, you can put a tool in, and I can crank up and I can get a lot more material removal rates, but then what does that affect down the road? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's really cool to talk about pulling 40 cubes of titanium, but if I'm tearing the machine apart in the process, mm -hmm. at the end of the year, am I actually making more money by pulling that much load versus if I had it back down to a more reasonable rate that's 
easier on the spindle bearing life and the ball exactly. screws and everything else. Yeah. So yeah, and that's why we've also have a uh, machine health component in all of our systems, so that we're looking at bearing health. We're looking at the load of a, a spindle just to rotate all the time. We're feeding that data to Datanomics, and that's that's the entire goal is to be able to give a customer uh, an actual report of saying, well, when you run this fast, it's going to cost you this much in machine maintenance down the road, hmm. and machine may only last this long. So that's really where the ultimate you know, goal is to, to, to have that as a reporting tool for a customer, because those are things that no customer can do today, even with a maintenance department. They just don't have enough... Uh, data and information to be able to determine those uh, parameters and those factors. It really feeds into your decision-making process That's then, right. right? So from a maintenance perspective, the learning side of it, you can you can get predictive on um, when your maintenance needs to come up, yeah. what kind of maintenance needs to happen, sure. things yeah. of that nature. That's really important because if we're looking at the current situation with you know service response time in mm -hmm. an industry that's really growing rapidly at the at the moment, and uh, if you don't have predictive technology like the technology that Karen produces, you uh, are waiting for something to fail in order to respond to it, and that response time could be weeks. Right. Multiply three to four weeks of response time times the shop rate, that's tremendous lost revenue, lost capacity, uh, customers that are disappointed because they're not getting parts. You don't. It doesn't have to be that way is the point. Mm -hmm. The point is that you can be predictive, you can determine when a tool needs to get maintenance, uh, and you can schedule that maintenance in a proactive way. So I think the combined technologies of the two companies allows people to have forethought instead of being responsive and reactionary to everything that's happening in a firefighting mode, which is very difficult for people. And, right. you know, long term, it's exhausting. Yeah. Right? You know, you're trying to grow top line in your, at your company uh, while you're trying to fight fires inside the company. It's really hard for these guys. And yeah. to give them the tools that they need to be look ahead, right? So look ahead, look up. Uh, look at TV monitors that are that are giving you information about the health and uh, and status of your of your production floor in real time. It's a massive benefit for folks. And mm -hmm. what what I find interesting is the profile of some of these owner operators, the, the executive teams of these companies that are utilizing this technology, are forward thinkers. Right? They invest in technology. They see the benefits of it. They can measure the benefits of it. I think what's really important is. Uh, purchasing technology, using it, and if you can't measure the benefits of it, you really don't know what the impact of it is on, on, on production, on output of the factory. So these people all have a common thread around um, kind of uh, thinking ahead, thinking about how to uh, drive efficiencies, uh, leverage digital technology to make them better. And they're always thinking about innovating on that dimension every single day. Are you seeing that, to me, it's a paradigm shift in how you think about your manufacturing process and how you look at machine downtime and things of that nature. Are you seeing that mental shift in shop owners? Is that, a, is that growing at an exponential I, curve as I, people are adopting? I don't adopting? think it's exponential, but it's, okay. it's definitely growing. I, I think the other piece that's kind of coming into play, too, is that obviously everybody's trying to automate now. Robots, mm -hmm. robots are going on machines. People are trying to automate every part of the process. So the eyes and ears that used to maybe hear something that was wrong before aren't even there anymore. So I think that's even driving it harder to having some sort of automated uh, way of measuring the machine health and, and just general capabilities that are going on yeah. and problems. That's an excellent point. Automation, uh, one of our themes for IMTS this year is automation. I mean, virtually almost every machine we bring is going to have some form of automation, whether it's software related or physical uh, unattended robot loading things of that nature so um, that's been a, a drastic shift especially since the pandemic yeah um, you know shops are, are realizing finding skilled people is harder and harder to do if you can automate it that's great but you lose some of that that eyes on target when sure. you automate so yeah it's something as simple as the coolant flow on a machine you know the mm -hmm. coolant pump gets clogged well a, a human walking by is going to be able to see that there's hardly any coolant coming out of the nozzle, right? But yeah. when you put a robot on the machine and there's nobody there anymore, that problem still happens. But mm -hmm. you need sensing technology then to be able to tell you there's a problem. Yep. So what about, I guess, operator mistakes or process mistakes? Um, I, I'm, I believe some of the technologies that you offer, uh, Rob, would... I'm going to back up to when I was running machines um, many, and it's been a long time ago now. I haven't run machines uh, <laughs> in, in many, many years, but... Uh, when I worked this prior to my life at Akuma, I worked for a grinder manufacturer, 
and uh, we did a project with a medical company and we were doing um it was a cobalt chrome material we had four plated wheels it was basically a double spindle grinder we had four plated wheels we were making four parts at a time um, i don't want to talk too much and, and out the company but um, we were doing the runoff uh, at our facility and being as it was a runoff what could possibly go wrong you know those are my <laughs> kind of my famous last words so we didn't have the fire suppression system hooked up we were grinding with a oil it was a very lightweight uh, oil it was practically like trying to grind with kerosene i mean it, it, looking back there was a comedy of errors you know kind of stacking up <laughs> And this part had a hardened steel dowel pin, basically, that was a center locator for the part. So as it's grinding on one side of the part, you get to a point where the wheel just lifts up. It does a very small little circular interpolation move over the top of that. And as we were making adjustments, somewhere along the way, that radial move got flipped. And it went down instead of up. Gosh. So I've got the spindle backed out, you know, of course, doors are shut and you're seeing everything from a distance, but I start half inch away from the part. Everything looked good, brought in a quarter inch apart, hundred thou off the part, everything looked great. Finally came down, sparked off on the part, turned the coolant on, let it rip. It's rolling along and this is about a hundred horsepower spindle with these nickel plated wheels. And me and the operator from the company, we're standing near the door and about that time, it hit that little move, and those plated wheels started digging into those hardened steel yeah. dial pins, and that thing went up like a Roman rocket ship. <laughs> I had flames that shot about oh 40 feet through the air, wow. spread across the ceiling of the, of the building, melted everything that was plastic inside the machine got melted. All my way covers, all the air lines. Um, didn't do any physical damage to the machine. Scared me half to death, though. It took me a while to kind of get the nerve back up to <laughs> once we got the machine fixed. But that spike in horsepower and all that, mm -hmm. your technology right. would have prevented yeah. my mistake from being able to do that, yeah. correct? So I'm, I'm assuming that you got employee of the month that, that month? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the CEO was not very happy with me. <laughs> um, yeah, so our technology absolutely would have prevented that. We're, we're looking at the power of driven tools, grinding wheels, whatever it is all the time. Um, we're looking for, you know, ab abnormal increases in those power levels. We also look at vibration, potentially strain of certain members of the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, we can react to those very quickly. Uh, we can re react to them automatically and, and prevent, absolutely prevent things like that from happening. Um, we also can adaptively control the feed rate of, of cutting uh, tools or grinding wheels so that we're optimizing the power that it's cutting at. If something happens like that, then it's automatically going to reduce the feed rate and even stop the machine if it deems that necessary. Okay. Yeah, I think you're also pointing at a, at a bigger issue. And if you take a look at the, the employees that are joining these companies today, mm -hmm. they're, they're very different from the employees that joined these companies 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. They don't have the fine machining skills. In some cases, they're not hiring people with fine machining skills, deep experience in machining technology. They're hiring operators, right? Operators to run machines that are computer controlled and automated, right? Mm -hmm. Automation is the big thing. And the reason for automation is because the workforce has changed, right? And so with this changing workforce, you've got to deploy technology that supplements them, that augments them. And the beauty of our products is that we produce a data stream or we're reading a data stream. And we, when you start to read a data stream, you look for trends and patterns. Mm -hmm. You look for the frequency of alarms that get triggered. You look, at, you look at those alarms now in the context of a production shift and what time the preponderance of alarms occurs. Is there a pattern there? Yeah. And so you look at these patterns and you say, geez, that's a problem. Or um, an alarm triggers because there's a problem with the machine and the only way you sense the problem with the machine 20 years ago was to listen for it. But today, those people, th th those skills are not there. So how are you listening for something that you would have heard 20 years ago, but today you pick up out of a data sensor yeah. located within the machine that tells you something's wrong? And so the software that we're building together needs to be so sophisticated that you're looking at things coming through the window, through the window of, of you know, the real-time window of time, and sense that there's there's either something going very right or something going very wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be smart enough as software people to predict that that data trend that we're seeing in the moment 
is an indicator of a, either a great thing or a not so great thing. Okay. And that's the power of what the, the two companies are, are building together. So, it, and I may be going down a different rabbit hole on this question, but how do you alert somebody? So when you're sensing, hey, wait a minute, things are, things are not on a good path here, how do you make it to the point so that a guy like me could look at it and go, ah, I'm sure it's okay, and, and turn around and walk off? Versus saying, no, wait a minute, you, you know, this is something you really need to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, in our case, I, I think in Karen's case, there's, uh, you know, adaptive control. So they're, they're feeding back in a, in a, in a, con- in a, to the control system to mm-hmm. affect change. Um, we're not feeding back to the control system yet. Yeah. Uh, it might be something we do together in the future, but we're not doing that today. Uh, there are two ways to notify people that something's headed in the wrong direction. One is visually, and I, I think visually is the fastest way to do it. Uh, is to visually give people cues that it's headed in the wrong direction. And that's the main focus of our product. When we mount 65-inch TVs on a production floor and you see a flashing uh, indicator that an Akuma machine um, has had a problem hmm. and someone needs to attend to it, that's, that's important. That's visually important, and a person's going to respond to that. The second methodology is audible, right? There might be an audible uh, indicator that something's wrong. We don't do that today, but it could be something we do in, in the future because I see control systems getting more and more sophisticated around facial recognition and mm-hmm. uh, adding audio to control systems and things like that. The third way is to notify people using text, email, uh, phone alerts, because everyone's carrying a smartphone on them on the production floor. You know, that's the next, uh, you know, the next way, the next wave of notification for uh, people who need to know. Just contrast that to, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm saying this uh, tongue in cheek, but some of the old timers that we interviewed in building our company said, I walk around the floor trying to smell smoke, hmm. right? Look yep. for fire or feel vibration in my feet. That's the way I figured out what was broken on the production floor. Well, the, those days are gone, right. right? Those days are gone when you have 100 machines you're asking one operator to run two to three machines in a shift. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that he can sit at one machine and watch it because the profit's gone if if you're dedicating a one-to-one relationship on an operator uh, for a specific machine and a specific part. There are parts that are hard enough and sophisticated enough that warrant a one-to-one relationship. But the owners I talk to say, I need people running three machines at a time. So, and, and if the cycle times are right, if the part's right, if, you know, three is a, a great number, I think the average is about 1.5. Um, but you now need to use technology, technology as a lever to help you um, apply your uh, span of attention to a broader set of problems in real time. Okay. If that makes any sense to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also want to clear up that, so... I- TMAC is going, and our, our on machine products are going to react instantly to anything that's happening on the machine. Mm-hmm. So, any the, the problem that you had, um, any type of changing cutting conditions, we're going to re- react immediately. I think where Datanomics is going to come into play is they're, they're going to look at that data and see things that aren't immediate. In other words, they're not instantaneous uh, problems, mm-hmm. they're, they're developing problems. Um, think that that's why we're not seeing them because we're looking at everything in real time. But they're going to look at the results of all of that data and predict that something is trending to failure, mm-hmm. which gives somebody a, a better chance and a more advanced notice to maybe try to look into the situation and see what might be, it, what can be corrected there. Um, or we potentially make suggestions or they make suggestions of what could be corrected. So if I could try to package up everything that I'm hearing you guys talk about, I think of it in terms of, of a high performance organization. How do you take a shop that has been successful? What they've done got them where they're at. They've been successful doing what they're doing, but how do you raise them up to another level? Mm-hmm. And to do that, everything's got to be functioning at a high performance level and controlled and, and everything kind of moving in, in, in a controlled atmosphere. That's basically what you guys combine your two technologies are doing is given that tool to shop owners who's been very successful, it's got their company to where they're at, but gives them the leverage to move that company, elevate it to another level. Yeah, Absolutely. and actually, you know, one of the things that even these top shops, you know, can't really correct is they have vendors that are providing tooling and material and coolant and, and, and all types of different products that are have some level of inconsistency. Hmm. So the guys that are the best out there still have to deal with that every day. 
yeah. and things that are caused by the material being a little bit different today. So that's where I think you know, even the best shops, highest you know, efficient shops that are out there, this, these are some things that we can really help by looking at the real-time data and uh, make, make corrections uh, with these standard you know, anomalies and changes that are coming into them every day. Okay. Excellent. Uh, it, the technology tests the assumptions. I think you said it. Sir. Say that again. The technology tests the assumptions. That's right? great. I like that. The <clears throat> assumption is that tomorrow we will we'll run production today, mm -hmm. and tomorrow we'll measure the output of production. Yeah. We'll, we'll either gauge block it, you know, we'll, we'll gauge measure it, we'll apply metrology to it to figure out if what we made yesterday was the right was the right quality, yeah. was met customer requirements. I talked to a customer yesterday in South Carolina that told me that his milling machine was booked out for 30 weeks. That's based on a set of assumptions. The yeah. set of assumptions are that that mach machine is going to produce a quality component, a precision component for the next 30 weeks and meet the forecast customer demand. Right. If anything happens to that process, the 30 weeks is out the window. Right. Yeah. So how do you apply technology to a methodology of machining parts to make to guarantee accuracy, to guarantee that you're going to hit the target when you pull your parachute, you're going to hit the target on the football field in the middle of the Notre Dame game, for example, right? Right. You, you've got to hit that target every single day. And um, the assumptions that the owners that we meet with have is that the capacity of their factory is fully utilized to the maximum uh, ability possible. And when they see our product come in and, and we test their, their assumptions on cycle time, we test their assumptions on utilization, we test their assumptions on part production, and we see over the course of 90 to 120 days, their assumptions were wrong. Right. That the utilization wasn't where they thought it was. It was lower, in some cases higher. Yeah. Um, that the cycle time wasn't what they quoted. It was something else. And that the quote is wrong. Mm -hmm. You need to. And so we're applying technology to make the process of estimating what production is going to produce as accurate as we possibly can. Because they're, these folks are not interested in making parts at a loss. Right. They're interested in making parts at a profit. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure their profit? How does a Karen Engineering TMAX solution ensure that this part's going to meet conformance, quality, you know, field testing, uh, life cycle, uh, et cetera, at a profit for that company? That's important. Rob comes to work every day at his company because he's trying to guarantee that they can deliver that consistently and repeatedly. We come to work every day trying to make sure that the, the impact of what Rob's doing ultimately works in the machine and works to give their business the profit objectives that they're trying to reach. It's really important, really important. These guys are all trying to grow top line. Right? Yeah. They're trying to grow it at a profit. That's the point, right? Get, get, get your business growing at a profit, increase profit, increase uh, customer satisfaction. And that's what, we're here to, that's what we're here to do every day. So how do you implement? So if I'm, I'm a shop owner, I've got 10 machines and five operators and making production, and I want to implement this kind of technology. What are the steps? What do I have to do? What kind of skill set do I need to have on staff to be able to implement this? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> from our technology side, basically the systems need to be installed on each machine. Um, the, best, uh, pe the best shops that implement our technology usually take someone and they, they become the expert in the technology. And then they get it all up and running and implemented. Now the data is available immediately. It's reacting to whatever's going on in the machine. It's helping improve cutting and, and tool life and, and all the different parameters that we're doing. Automate the process of bringing tools into the machine, measuring parts outside of the machine, and correcting automatically. That all needs to get implemented by the you know with our help. The customer implements it and brings it online. From there, the data is immediately available to Datanomics, and then they can take over from the analytics side. Yeah, okay. and so we plug into the controller, and we're the wingman to the data stream that's being produced by their product, uh, and we see that you know we're, we're picking up on the draft of that data stream. We're picking up the data, processing that data instantly, and providing them a real-time production score for the directional health of that of that job. It's very different than what they've done in the past. As I said, they tomorrow they'll measure to see if yesterday they produced the right output. You don't want to be solving yesterday's problems tomorrow. You want to be solving today's problems now. Okay. Closed loop control and real-time production scoring. That's the way to go after it.
Excellent. Well, guys, this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your time and joining us here today. Thanks, Wade. Thank you, Wade. So if the guys, uh, any, or I say guys, I should say people yeah. in the field listening, they want to learn more about your products. Rob, how do they find you? Um, we're on the internet, on the web at www.kareneng.com. Okay. And we're at datanomics.io, D-A-T-A-N-O-M-I-X.io. Perfect. Guys, thank you so much today. And thank you all for joining us. If you have any thoughts, questions, ideas for future podcasts you'd like to hear, please reach out to us and let us know. Otherwise, till next time, we'll see you then. Mm-hmm.